Good morning. Good morning. I am so glad to see everyone here, despite the ugly weather we had last night. So horrible. I had to get the snow plow out. It was just terrible. No, I'm just joking. It's wonderful weather, actually. When it's snow on the ground and not on the streets. I really love that. Four feet on the ground and none on the streets, and I'm a happy, happy camper. You know, today we're going to talk about when God recognizes your faith, He's going to praise you. How many of you like being praised in here? Raise your hand. Wives, you better raise your hands because your husbands tell me you want it all the time. No, they didn't say that. I was just joking. Now, you know, one of the things I do to show my wife that I appreciate her, I picked up recently, guys, and I'm going to tell you now, this will help you out in your life, is you go to the store down the road by the farm store, and it's on the left of the road, and it's a floral shop. And they have carnations. Really cheap. But it's the thought that goes behind them. And I try to give her a carnation every week. Just to let her know, hey, I appreciate what you do. This is a little praise from me. You know, growing up though, praise in a family of four or five actually wasn't all that popular. It was more of, why can't you be like this sibling? Why can't you be like this sibling? Why can't you be like your best friend or your friend over here? I mean, you grew up with that from your parents a lot. Yeah, I did. You know, especially when it was a contest. Who could show each other up more in the family? But one thing my siblings could not do me on was school. I had a fourth grade teacher, and she was notorious for being mean in class. You spoke up, she took the ruler to your knuckles. And I didn't get raised in a Catholic school. This was a public school. You talked in line, and you, had a, and you were a girl, and you had long hair. She would yank your hair and tell you, shh. At lunch, she would teach us to eat with the spoon the proper way, and not like some hooligan animal. So when you went to her class, she'd have on the board, a math problem, a subtraction problem, a multiplication problem, a division problem, and then a fractions problem. And you had to do these every day. And you got a grade on it. Now, if you passed them, you no longer had to do them. So there was a reward. So I was very student about this. I'm like, okay, very studious and looking at that math problem. I'm like, I can get this one right. It's Four problems long, but I can do this. And then, if she graded your paper, at the end of the day, she handed you an award that said, good job, you passed the math equation. You no longer have to do it. So I'd go home and look, look, Mom, look, Dad, I passed the math equation. My parents were like, well, that's a good job. I'm like, yes. And then, you know, of course, with the subtraction, same thing, I passed. It took a little bit to catch on. All the way to the fractions. I'm going to tell you, I never got that award. That one was one that evaded me from the time I stepped into her classroom to the time I left her fourth grade class because I didn't understand fractions, and I still kind of don't. The very basic ones are easy, but she did all these funky numbers, and I didn't understand it. But praise is important. We thrive on it. We live on it. If no one ever praises us, we become grumpy people. We become people who do not appreciate anything. We become very much of a hating society because there's no one else to tell us, hey, that was a good job. We appreciate that. You've done a wonderful job. That's good. How would you like it if God praised you? Let me raise your hand if you would love it if God was to praise you all the time in his circle of angels and his save, our Savior, his Son at his side and all the saints up there. He goes, look, 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 look. There's Roger. Good job, Roger. That's a great job. Look, 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 Melanie. Melanie, good job, Melanie. Bob, we're still working on you, but good job anyway. <laughs> You know, we'd love it, right? That'd be awesome if God recognized us of all the people in all the world. They said, good job. That is who you are, and I love it that you're doing that great job. You would think that'd be, oh yeah, beat that up. But there's a problem. And we're going to look at that problem today. When God praises us because of our faith, there are some hiccups that can come down that road. We're going to go into Job chapter 1, 6 through 11. One day the angels came to present to themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. Now, let's pause there for a minute. If you understand God, theologically, this seems impossible, because God cannot be in the presence of evil. Evil cannot be in the presence of God. 
But I think God bends it a little here. He invites Satan in. This is what I think is happening. He invites Satan up to his throne. He wants to have a conversation with Satan. Now, why can he do this? Because Satan has no soul. Angels are not soul beings. They are created beings. We have a soul. We have that piece of God in us where they did not have the breath of God given to them. So he can call Satan up and say, here we are, let's talk. You're not a part of me. You're something I created separate, but I can talk to you. So he calls him up to the throne in the line of angels. There's Satan pacing back and forth like, come on, really? What do I got? I, I got to go up talk to God right now. I got such a busy schedule on earth. But God has summoned me, so i got to be there. So he goes up to God, and God addresses him and says, where have you come from? I said, God doesn't know. Satan says, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Now here's another thing we have to understand about God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and Satan. In case you've never heard this before, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are omnipresent. That means they're everywhere all at once. They're right here, they're in that back room, they're down the street, they're across the world, they're everywhere at once. They don't have to travel anywhere. They are never not here. So when you're doing things, keep that in mind that God is always there. You can't go from room to room and leave God in another room. It's impossible. But Satan, on the other hand, is not omnipresent. He can't be in this church and down the street in someone's house. He can't be across the world at that moment. Now what he can do is, he has a legion of angels that are now called demons at his disposal. And he can leave one in certain places and say, hey, monitor the area. I'll be back and forth. I want to check on this. I want to check on that. So when we look at Satan, we have to understand that he's not everywhere at once. So if he's picking on me, that means everyone else is free to go do what they need to do and have an easy day. So if Satan's picking on you, be glad because he's not there to pick on someone else. See, it works out for the benefit. We're helping each other out. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? Since you're wandering around looking at all the people out there, trying to mess up everyone's lives, have you noticed Job? Just a question, Satan. Because there is no one on earth like him. No one on that planet, or our planet, at that time in history, was like Job. Job was living an exemplary life. Because he is blameless and upright. doesn't mean he didn't sin. It just means he didn't cause things into his life. He didn't invite things into his life. He didn't go out searching for things that's going to get him in trouble. He avoided it. A man who fears God and shuns evil. Satan replies, does Job fear God for nothing? Really, God, you, you think Job only fears you because he just wants to fear you. I think there's ulterior motives here, God. Let's examine this. Since you want to bring him up, let's examine this. In verse 10, have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. Satan has kept his eye on Job. Satan has been watching Job. Satan has been trying to get in at Job. But Satan couldn't get in at Job. God wouldn't let him. God put angels around Job's house. God put angels around Job's flocks. So that when Job was at home, life was good. It wasn't miserable. It wasn't what everyone else was experiencing. Because Job was faithful to God. And God acknowledged that faithfulness and said, hey, I'm going to protect you. And then, when, can you imagine your whole livelihood is sheep raising or goat raising? Now, the odds of you never having a miscarriage in a sheep or a goat would be impossible. Because you are, your sheep are going to miscarry sometimes. The odds of not having a defected sheep or goat is going to be impossible. But Job didn't experience that. A disease that runs through a sheep herd or a goat herd and wipes out some of them. Job never experienced that. Job would just, there you are, I'm going to put a sheep over here. Man, they just prospered. I'm going to put goats over here, and they prospered. Wild animals didn't bother him. He was a billionaire when it comes to sheep and goats. He, whatever he put his hands to, God blessed him. God said, I'm going to help you out here. I'm going to make this work for you. You're not going to struggle. 
And Satan recognized that. And Satan calls God out on that. He says, look, man, God fears you for a reason. Because you've never given him a reason not to. You've never given him a reason to doubt you, to not trust you. But in verse 11 he says, but now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Satan is trying to tempt God. Now, if you know the story, and I'm pretty sure everyone in here does, knows that Satan is going to be given the opportunity to strike at Job. So, Job is going to lose his children. He's going to lose servants. He's going to lose all of his flocks. He's going to lose everything. And finally, Satan says, look, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. I've taken everything from him, God. And yeah, you're still protecting me? No, that's not fair. You're not playing by the rules. As if there was rules. So God says, fine, you can attack his body, but you can't take his life. So where does Job end up at? The garbage heap. Where all the refuge is dumped from the city. He's allowed to sit there because he can't be in society because he's afflicted with boils, which means he's an outcast. He cannot be a part of society. So he's sitting in the garbage heap, eating people's garbage with boils of pain on him and scraping them so that they'll pop open and relieve himself somewhat. And dogs, who are wild animals, he allowed them to come up and lick him. Maybe that would make him feel better. So that's Job's life at this point. Satan was pointed to him and said, God says, look, Satan, do you see him? I want to praise Job. I want to show off Job. He's a pride and joy of mine. Satan, have you considered him? I'm sure Job would have been very pleased about saying, God, please don't praise me. Please don't uplift me. I don't want that kind of praise. And a lot of us don't, really, honestly. A lot of us don't need a pat on the back when we do something good. But some of us do, and that's okay. But once in a while, we all need to have that little recognition. And what a way to get it from God. God says, look, I want to recognize you. I want to lift you up. You're doing such a wonderful job. I want to brag about you. But here's the result. So when you look at there's three things we need to look at and consider when we are lifted up because of our faith, when we're praised because of our faith. And the first thing is this. God will protect us from most of what Satan does. We're exempt from a lot of Satan's attacks. Not all of them, like Job has shown to us, not always will we have a perfect life. Not always will everything go our way. But a lot of the attacks that Satan does to other people, we seem to be exempt from. Trials with family. Trials in the world around us. You know, illnesses that didn't make sense. Burglaries. People getting beat up on drugs. All these things, we seem to be exempt from. And trust me, I've been around those the United States quite a bit. I've been in Florida. I've seen where Satan can live and what he can do to a community. And it's horrible. And I've had to lock my doors and fear for my life. I've lived in Louisville and I guarantee you every day and night I fear for my life. A car backfired, you hit the floor because you didn't know it was coming your way. But here in Knox, I don't see that. I see God's protection a little heavier. Now maybe some of you are like, well, Ron, have you considered the drugs we have down the road? Have you considered... Well, yes, that's everywhere, but we don't deal with the theft on our front porches. I don't have to worry about leaving something in my front yard because I'm living by faith and God says, you don't need to be scared. Don't be scared about what's going on around you. Trust me, I've got you. So now that I've opened that up and said, God, you're right. I don't know why I was scared in these other locations. You had me the whole time. I never got killed. I never got beat up. I was just living on a fear thing. But thank you, God. And God says, there you go. Now that you're praising me, I want to praise you and lift you up and protect you a little more. Show you that this life is not always negative. But then again, Satan is allowed to come in and do little attacks on us. So we're never going to be exempt, but we will have a hedge of protection around us a little more than others will have. And you'll be able to see it. You'll be able to see the life they live and say, wow, that looks ugly. I'm glad I don't have that. That's because you have faith in God. And God says, because you have faith in me, I'm going to lift you up and I'm going to protect you a little more. Secondly, God's going to help you with your work and the goals in your life. As we discussed in Sunday school, there is one road with God. One road for each one of us. And God says, here, I'm going to put you at the start of your road, and I'm going to show you that this is where your road should go. Now, there's tons and millions of exits and entrances on this road. 
Now God says, I don't want you taking them. Those look good, but don't get off the road. Stay on the yellow brick road, Dorothy. Don't get off. But what do we do? We want to get off. This looks fun. We go over here and we come back on. But God says, look, as long as you stay on my road, you live by faith, you follow my instructions, and you trust in me, and you allow me to take the consequences when you don't like where they're going, but you're staying faithful to me, and the world doesn't like you, trust in me. i got you. God says, I'm going to help you with your work. You ever met people that just seem to think, that seem like, no matter what they do, they prosper? I mean, go play the... Uh, the uh, gambling, you know, and they, they, how'd you do that? Or they play the stock market, and they just seem to pick everything right. Or they get a family business, and man, it just booms. No matter what they do, they can grow gardens like better homes and gardens can. I'm like, really? How? It's because they walk by faith, and they say, God, this is yours. God, this is yours. It's not mine. You blessed me with it. But God, I'm going to give it to you. And because I'm going to trust you with it, I'm going to give it all to you. And God says, that's great. That's awesome. I'm going to bless you with that. I want to help you with that. Because God understands their heart. Their heart says that because it's not mine, I don't have the right to say what I'm going to do with it. I've got to trust God. And if God tells me to do this with this, or God tells me to put my garden out for everyone to eat on, then that's, that's God. God, I've got a garden here. It's beautiful. It's going great thing. So I'm going to let you know if you're telling me to do it and let the community come in and eat anything they want, that's fine. You grew that. I didn't. You made that seed. I didn't. For example, Jesus tells a parable of a farmer who is doing great things for the community. And God wants the blessing. So God blesses him and his crops grow beyond belief. He's growing crops where he never grew crops before. But what does he do? He does something that he should not have done. He leads his faith and says, you know, yes, God, I realize you blessed me with this, but I'm tired of sharing. I don't want to share this anymore. I want it all for myself. So he tears down his existing barns and builds bigger ones to store all this for himself instead of allowing the blessings to flow out like he had in the past. Then God wakes him up that night and says, dude, guess what? I tried to give you something. I tried to bless you. I tried to give you the work of your hands to let it grow out because I wanted you to bless more people. You tried to hoard it. Tonight, you'll come home and talk to me about it. And the guy died and had to answer for that. But see, God, when he praises us, it's because he wants to help us out. And he wants us to know that he loves us and he, he cares for us. And this is a way he can do that. And thirdly, God will give you your needs in ample amounts. You know, I, I heard two youth ministers talking at a conference one day. They were on stage and they were talking. And they were going from town to town to town to town witnessing at some schools. Well, the funny thing is, they started in the morning at 7 in the morning to go to this high school, and then they were going to travel over to this high school, and they both had forgotten their wallets. They were so excited that they forgot their wallets. They had no money. And they didn't think to eat at any of the schools, and it was like 2 in the afternoon, and they were starving. So they thought. And so they're driving down the road, and they start saying, God, we left our wallets. God, we have no money, and we're really hungry, and it's another 30 miles to the next school. God, we could really use something right now. We don't know where you're going to come out with it at, but we could really use something right now. So God, if you will just help us out. And God did. They were following behind a hostess truck. The hostess truck ran a red light. Broadside. No one was hurt, but hostess flew everywhere. Now the driver gets out and looks at the mess and goes, oh my gosh, I've got to pay to have this cleaned up. So he, they said the guy had a great thought. He stopped and looked at everyone looking around who was like drooling over everything lying on the ground. And the driver says, hey, everybody, if you want anything on the ground, it's free, take it. Man, they had ho-hos, they had Twinkies, 
They had snowballs that day for lunch. They had a youth minister's paradise for lunch, minus the pizza. So they said, you know, that was all God. That was, that, out of the blue, this driver just blitzed the red light. And boom, and now all this free food was for them. Amples, man, they loaded up their car, they said, and they took the rest of it to the next high school and was giving it away at the high school, which really made them popular amongst the students, let me tell you. God wants to bless us. God wants to praise us. But like in Job, understand, your faith, when you're really giving faith to God and you're really putting trust in God and he lifts you up, Satan's going to be right there saying, hey, God, Oh, yeah, God, I see that person. I see that Christian over there, and you seem to be protecting them. What if you just back off a little bit and let me really out? We have to watch because we can't be the person that says, when it gets ugly, all right, God, you've blessed me most of my life, but now things have gotten ugly. I've gotten a disease, or I've, I've lost my finances, and everything's just not hunky-dory like it used to be. God, I'm done with this game, then. I thought we were... Compadres, I'm done. I'm out of here. And Satan's like, ha, I knew it, I knew it. Don't be that person. Because God wants to keep lifting you up and praising you. And you can guarantee he does it every day in heaven. He's looking at all the Christians saying, look at this one. Look at this one. Look at this one. Look at this one. And he's saying, look at all my children. They're doing wonderful. And that's what we should be striving for, to get that praise from God. Not just biding our time and saying, hey, you know, God, I'll just be happy to get in heaven. I've heard so many Christians say, I'll just be happy to get in heaven. Really? You want the C on the report card instead of the A? And God says it's easy to get the A. You don't have to do division. You don't have to do fractions. You just got to follow my instructions and trust in me. Like always, we offer an invitation time. The greatest praise you will ever receive from God is the day that you acknowledge his son as your Lord and Savior. And if you don't believe me, read the scriptures where it says the angels rejoice at every time a lost sheep is found. There's a party going on. There's a festival going on. Every moment someone says, I recognize there's Jesus. I recognize I need him. I recognize I can't do life without him. And they accept him. So as our praise team comes up,